Okay, this is Friday, June 23rd, 2017. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Maureen Sullivan. Our cameraman is Dan McDermott of Natick Pegasus, and we are privileged to have with us today Lawrence Mitchell. Welcome, Larry. Well, I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to be with you. Oh, thank you. May I ask when you were born? I was born June 22, 1933. So you just had a birthday. Yes, I, yesterday. Congratulations. And where were you born? I was born in Boston. And did you grow up in Boston? No, I grew up in Dedham. Okay. And what community do you currently live? I live in Westwood now. Your marital status? Never been married. And no children? No children. Okay. Tell us a bit about Dedham growing up. Dedham, at the time I was growing up in Dedham, it was a small town, and it had, a, everybody was everybody's friend. We never locked doors. And we didn't know a jealousy or there was no, no crime. It was a beautiful existence for yours truly. Mm -hmm. I finished the Dedham schools and I went from there to Sacred Heart and Sharon, run by Catholic brothers. Then at the time I came back to, De to, to Dedham High and I was there in Dedham High for four years and the last year I, I ran as president of the class and won. So I was class president of 1952, mm -hmm. as well as being the most popular and the class wolf. Okay. Three different titles. Class wolf. Yeah, that. Let's talk a little more about uh, growing up during the 1940s. Of course, right. that was World War II. Right. First of all, do you remember what you were doing when Pearl Harbor was bombed. Yes, I remember exactly. I was w with my mother and my two brothers, and we were up, sh uh, up visiting our, her brother, which would be my uncle, in, in, uh, in another town. And we were surprised at that Sunday hearing that the Japanese had bombed Pearl Harbor. Uh, I was too young to uh, to know what it was all about at that time, back in the, at the time of, the, of Pearl Harbor. And uh, my mother was uh, a driver for an organization during the war. She drove some kind of military. And of course, we had to be careful of making sure that our lights were out. We had lights out all the time because we thought planes would be coming over and uh, going to the movie mm -hmm. was, all you needed was a tin can and a dime. And that got you into the movie theater every Saturday. And of course, the, the Dedham Community Theater was a big thing in our lives. It was only walking distance from where I lived on E Street in Dedham. And I grew up as a very happy kid. We had no crime, no delinquency. No terror, nothing then that, that, that exists so much today in different towns and communities. Okay, so you're, uh, you were graduating in 52. Of course, World War II has ended, but now we're in the middle of the Korean War. Mm -hmm. And what were you being told about Korea? How, how were you getting your facts? Well, to be perfectly honest, from the group of people I hung around with, uh, some of them were from Jamaica Plain, some were my friends from Sacred Heart School. And one of the, our friends had given his life trying to save a, another airman down the Cape, and he lost his life, and it inspired us all to join the service. And because of, because of the fact that the uniforms were blue and my eyes were blue, I joined the Air Force. <laughs> And uh, I told everybody I was going to summer camp. <laughs> now I'm only kidding. You joined the Air Force because the uniform matched your eyes. Yeah. That's well, a new one. Is, isn't that a, well, besides that, I had a brother in the Coast Guard, my brother John, mm -hmm. my brother Thomas in the Army. So the Air Force, the only thing that was left for me. Okay. 
Um, and uh, don't get me wrong, mm -hmm. I've seen too many pictures about Marines to want to join the Marines. Understandable. Yeah. Uh, and you mentioned before the interview that your brother Thomas was uh, stationed in Hawaii while he was serving in the Army, yeah. and he got to play a small, bit from, a bit role right. in... From here to eternity. And what scenes were he, was he in? A big button? Uh, what scenes were he in? Uh, Oh, he was in the scene where they were using machines. Fellows were falling down as a result of the aircraft machine gunning them. Oh, during the attack itself? Yes, ma'am. Wow. He got $320. Good for him. Yeah. And your brother John was in the Coast Guard. Yes. And where was he stationed? In Boston. Mm -hmm. He never left Boston. Because my brother, Brother John, was so good at paperwork. Uh, that they didn't, they couldn't let him go anywhere else because he was the only one that knew the system. And I understand your brother John's still with you. Um, yes, brother John is still, he's a little bent over because mm -hmm. of the money that he's carrying. He never married either. Yeah. But he didn't have the, the relationship that I had had uh -huh. in my lifetime. And I understand he's still working. Yes, ma'am. And where does, who does he work for? He works for NSTAR, uh, the new company, mm -hmm. Source, Eversource. Oh, Eversource, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's get back to you. Uh, class of 52, deciding to join the Air Force. Where did you sign up? I signed up in Boston. Okay. And we were, after signing up, we were put on a train, and we were brought to a place upstate New York called Samson, was the name of the air base where we took our basic training. And was this the first time you were ever away from the Boston area? If, yeah, first time because Sharon was, where I went to school was mm -hmm. just a short distance. And right. I, was, I was home on weekends. So you're in uh, upstate New York. Yes. And tell us a little bit about basic. Well, basic was a great thing for me. Mm -hmm. We had uh, someone who was, Part of the basic program, one of our, he wasn't he do what they call the DI, or the drill sergeant, mm -hmm. but he was a member who had had military experience in the outside world. And he was in charge of par parading us around to a point where we were the best parade, we were the best group of soldiers marching where we ended up winning a big contests and we made us proud. It was. The, it was a great feeling. Mm -hmm. And aside from marching, uh, did you uh, get training in how to fly a plane or something, something no, like that? No, no, no. no. Uh, from there, we, we were put on a plane and uh -huh. taken to a place called Cheyenne, Wyoming. And I was scheduled to be in automotives. That was my assignment. The reason that they picked this for me and they had two choices, because I have a good memory and because my father ran Mitchell's taxi, limousine, and service. So they felt that I should know a little bit about mechanics. I fooled them. I didn't really know. <laughs> but I, I played that game mm -hmm. and went to school <laughs> to learn to be an auto. Yeah. Okay, so how long were you in basic in Upper State New York? Oh, about uh, a month and a half, okay. about a month and a half. Mm -hmm. And how long were you in stationed in Cheyenne? Cheyenne? Uh, I was stationed in Cheyenne for a few months. First they had, I was the teacher, I taught English to foreign students. That was my assignment. You find that unusual? Very. <laughs> yeah. Well, I do speak English, and English was one of my better subject in high school. Okay. <laughs> so when I see someone that's not speaking proper grammar, I inadvertently correct them, regardless of the situation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Okay, so uh, you're in the automotive course. Yes. Okay. And what were you being taught? How to, how to maintain uh, automotive, automobile engines, and, and mechanic, general mechanics. And I graduated from that school. And they, 
Uh, then I was transferred, not transferred, but I got on a ship in uh, San Francisco. Yeah, uh, the, the the ship was going to Japan. That was our next port. port. It was J Japan. Okay. So now we're taught. We're are we well. Still? I have to tell you another thing. Going oh, back, go ahead. going back to the automobiles. I hung out with a guy mm -hmm. who was from Stoughton, and he and along with his friends, we built our own car to t take a leave home. We had leave time, and we drove the car that we made back. We had a fella from New Jersey, and we had to drop him off like a bad habit, and, <laughs> and we drove the same car back after our leave was up, and we were not AWOL. Wow. As you see, a perfect record. Mm -hmm. Good for you. Yeah. Okay, so we're, in, uh, we're still in 1954. Right. It's sort of like the tale, it's, the armistice had been kind of signed in Korea. Well, yeah, this kind of doesn't really mean anything because mm -hmm. we were still considered the Korean War. In other words, the so-called armistice had not been signed, mm -hmm. so we come under that as being part of the Korean War. So when I say to different people, I'm a Korean War veteran disabled, I, I could say that truthfully because it's on my record. So you've been sent to Japan, mm -hmm. and what part of Japan? Uh, Itazuki was the name of the base, Itazuki, in southern Japan. Southern Japan. I was sent there in order to, because I was going out to an island called Mishima, an isolated island called Mishima. That was, but there was a gal that worked in social services who eventually fell in love with me, and she didn't want me to go on that radar site. She did everything she could. I had my teeth. Fixed constantly, <laughs> there was nothing wrong with it. But eventually, I had to get on on a, a train, uh, go to uh, a Japanese town, get on a ferry boat, and go out to Mishima. Mishima was the radar site, mm -hmm. the name of the island in the Sea of Japan. Okay, let's uh, keep you in southern Japan for a little bit. Okay, this is of course the years immediately following the Second World War, uh, Japan really took it on the chin later, uh, later on. Where, did you see, still see elements of destruction? On no, the, no, 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 I didn't. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I didn't see, I didn't go looking for them and I didn't see any of them. Mm -hmm. But uh, ev everybody was as happy, everybody wanted to be as good as they could. Uh, a lot of people, especially the Japanese, would go out of their way because of the fact that they were treating well by us Americans. Mm -hmm. And on, I can't wait to tell you what happened on the island. Go right ahead. Well, I mean, it was a mystery that we're going out there, of course, to, and we arrived by ship because the, we left the town and we went from there to Itazuki and uh, we got into a truck, piled into a truck, and drove up a long road to the top of the hill on the island. That's where our base was. And uh, of course, we were new, and, and it was a whole new ex experience for us. So we soon learned that we're living the life of Riley because of the fact that in the mess hall, we had waitresses wait on us. Uh, in our barracks, we had someone to clean up and make our beds and we had women that did our laundry. We contributed a very small amount because at that time, the American dollar was worth a lot more than the yen or the Japanese currency. So we could buy the world at a very reasonable price. So was this at the radar site? Or yeah, was, the okay, radar site. At the radar site, wow. Oh, yeah. So what were your duties once you got to the oh, radar I, site? I, I was, uh, my duties was taking care of the dinky, that's electricity in Japanese. We had uh, huge diesel machines. We had about four huge diesel machines, and we were responsible for seeing that the site, the radar site, the, the site itself, the radar, and all the other things had to be elect, get their electricity from us. We were self-sufficient. 
and uh, it wasn't long that didn't take me long to learn how to operate them. It was uh, an old-fashioned way, but once I learned, uh, it stayed with me, and we never had a problem with our electricity for the length of time of three years that I was on the island. Three years on the island, wow. Yeah, but I had a good time. Yeah. Okay. Our, our mail was dropped by plane, and we had these supply ships come in. The supply ships, of course, belong, didn't belong to the service. There was a, there were uh, civilians that were, had these. They have a name for it. Mm -hmm. Like contractors. Yeah, the contractors. Mm -hmm. uh, another, uh, the, they weren't affiliated with the service. They got paid for their services rendered, and the captain of the ship that came in periodically, especially during the hot, warm weather would allow us to play Tarzan and dive off the ship. We thought that was the greatest thing since sliced bread. <laughs> had, had a great time. Now the purpose and, of... Uh, we had, oh, Joseon, we had girlfriends. Oh. Some of us had our own women. I don't know if I should make this known to the world that we lived this way, but mm -hmm. being a regular person, we were very happy and mm -hmm. contented. And when you're on an isolated island, there's nothing more comforting than companionship. Right. I, again, understandable. Uh -huh. So, as far um, the radar site itself, what were what was the radar monitoring? Any kind of activity coming out of North Korea. We were there to early warning is what it's called. That's the whole idea of a radar site is to alert the Air Force bases that the enemy or somebody, something was coming over from a certain part or a certain area, and we had the radar to detect anything of that kind. This was a full-time job 24-7. And you provided the electricity I for three years. I certainly did. The dinky. We call it the, the dinky. dinky. Okay. Were you, uh, did you get off the island every once in a while? Well, yeah, once in a while. Mm -hmm. we, we got off the island. I, I, we didn't get off as buddies and pals. We got off individually because uh -huh. they couldn't spare uh, that many people at that, at going out at that time. In other words, you, you went out on your own. Right. And you had a good time. You went to another, I went to a Navy base when I had time. Excuse me. I'm getting some. Go right ahead. Jeez. This. Mm -hmm. I haven't thought about this for so many years. Wow. So, Larry, you um, had mentioned at the start of the interview that there was something that came back with you. Yeah, I, on the radar site, uh, it was my job to pump the diesel fuel. And I can recall one incident where it was storming at night, and it was in, it was. It was mandatory that you didn't let the uh, get too low. So when it got low, you had this 55-gallon drums on a higher level on the hill adjoining, adjacent to the radar machines themselves, the huge machines. So it was a stormy night, and I had to pump, I had to pump diesel fuel into our supply. And I can recall the incident because I, they're 55 gallon drums and the, the lightning was going on and thundering, but it was imperative, I use that word imperative, it was imperative that we had that diesel fuel in the area that it was needed at the time or else we'd be in trouble, the machines would break down. So while I was up there, there was a storm and I could recall, I could recall the time where I was letting the diesel fuel go into the container, which went down by, uh, uh, in other words, the level, mm -hmm. they have a name for that. So I remember like being uh, zapped by a bolt of lightning and when uh, I finally came to, uh, I was in mud and I noticed that the 55 gallon was empty meaning that all the diesel fuel had gone out and I really felt a little weird. 
And uh, I didn't make much of it other than the fact that I was very happy that the fuel had done it, what it was supposed to do, fill in it. Uh -huh. So I shut everything off and mm -hmm. I, I just felt a little different internally. But I didn't make anything of it because I had everything going. You know. I, that was an incident that occurred to me, that happened to me. So you were hit by lightning. Yeah. Wow. Uh, the, the part I was mentioning, the fact that you are disabled. Yes, I am. And why, how did you become disabled? Well, uh, when I'm talking about disabled, I have a heart condition. Uh, well, they can't trace it back. As a matter of fact, I'm sterile. And the, 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 well, the government turns around and says, I could have been sterile before I went into the Air Force. Mm -hmm. So th they, they had a justifiable argument because had I had children prior to my enlistment, and these children were mine, but I was sterile. I'm still, I mean, after all these years, I'm still, right. uh -huh. yeah. And there was, a, there was a pamphlet that you had shown me. I believe it was, um, let's see if we can find it here. I can't find it on this one. Oh, here, that's yours. Yeah, the, the pamphlet is the fact that ah, I, this is the right. one that you're okay. looking for. Uh, it's a very rare, mm -hmm. you could, no, you could. No, that's okay, if you can hold no, that you up for a I second. want you to read from it. That's all right. So you could mm -hmm. have. The, and are you, um, are you a, like a patient here? Or? I'm, I'm a patient, mm -hmm. I'm a patient at the Veterans in West Roxbury and Jamaica Plain. Uh -huh. Uh, I, I have a condition that, that is called uh, congestive heart failure. That's uh -huh. the bottom line ah. there. Mm -hmm. So other, other than that, I'm very, very healthy. Yeah. I told you, mentioned. And the, the, the term, I believe it's called ammo. Right, put on the, the, the front of the, right front of the mm -hmm. thing. Yeah. That's and do you know how to pronounce it? Not really, I could kill oh, okay. less. <laughs> I mean, all I know is I got green, I call them green alligators. In green London. alligators. Yeah. <laughs> Remember that. But uh, were you affected by radiation at some point? Sterile. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's the, uh, whole, the whole thing. And of course, as I mentioned before, when I try to get some type of compensation, mm -hmm. their argument was you didn't, weren't tested before you came in uh -huh. and you're sterile now, that doesn't mean that this radar incident was the cause. See, I, mm. I mean, we both have a point. I'd mm -hmm. say, uh, but there's no proof that I could have children. If I had had children before I went on the service, I wouldn't have any problem collecting for the radiation mm -hmm. situation that occurred mm -hmm. on the radar site so many years ago. Okay, let's get you back to the radar site, and you've been on there for the three years. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us what happened next. What happens next is my time is, is up. I'm coming back to the States, and I go to a an Air Force base in Missouri. Okay, yeah. and what rank were you when you were discharged? Uh, I was just an airman first class, that's all. Okay. Did you receive any medals or commendations? Oh, yeah, for, I, for, good, for a Korean deal, mm -hmm. I was, I did, as a matter of fact, if you look, you'll yeah. see that, mm -hmm. I think it was the Korean Service Medal. Oh yeah, National I got the, Defense. I got the whole nine yards here: Korean Service Medal, United Nations Service Medal, National Defense Service Medal, Good Conduct. I think Good Conduct is the best medal that anybody. Could, that means you didn't mess up. That was Whiteman Air Force Base in Whiteman. Missouri. Okay, there we go. So 
So it was not too far from where President Truman was born. Oh, okay. Yeah. So Larry, it's now, uh, I think, 1956, 1957? Right. Okay. You've just been discharged. Uh, did you come back to this area? And I joined the reserves in Bedford, the Air Force Reserves in Bedford. And what did you do with the uh, reserves? Whatever they wanted me to. Okay. Yeah. I, I was very happy with that great you know, companionship or with other people, other veterans, Air Force. Yeah, it, you know, it felt, it felt good to be with uh, people that were in the same boat or in the same plane. Mm -hmm. Okay, and how long did, were you serving uh, with the reserves? I served with them until they got a, I got a discharge from them, a medical discharge. Okay. And that medical discharge was something to do with the heart. And when was that? I think it was 61 yeah. according to their sheet? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, Larry, you served during, shall we say, an interesting time uh, American military when, okay, you, the shooting war is over, but you're, you're kind of right. keeping, keeping your eyes on the Russians and stuff. No, well, I mean, when I got out of the service mm -hmm. and I was in the reserves, things didn't, start, things started to happen with Vietnam. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I mean, I wasn't going to make it a point to go back into the service because I felt I had served my time. But the, 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 there was a real crisis in the world, in the United States, this thing called Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And I was very happy to be in, in civilian life rather than to have to look forward to that. Okay. And what did you do in civilian life? Uh, I was in public relations. First, I was a salesman. I used to sell jacuzzi whirlpool baths. I sold them to very fine people, and I did business with Ted Williams. He was, he, he was out to the eastern states where we're putting it on, and I wasn't big on sports growing up in Dedham, but I knew he was a baseball player. <laughs> so he used to come over and use the jacuzzi every, every day after work. Well, it kind of helps when Williams also served in the Air Force, didn't yeah. it? Oh, yeah. We talked about everything except Baseball. I didn't really know that much. Who's on first? <laughs> What's on second? You know, the whole nine yards. Oh, do they have nine yards in baseball? No. And what did you do? Uh, at, okay, what did you do after you uh, stopped selling jacuzzis? Well, I got a job in public relations with AMCO, double A M C O, AMCO Transmission. Any American car that doesn't have a crack case, a front wheel drive like an El Dorado, a Tornado with the exception of the C3, the 400 lockup converter and diesel. We pick up and deliver if the car can be driven and we're open half a day Saturday. Wow. <laughs> well, well, I did extremely well mm -hmm. with this company located in Framingham. I had the best boss, the good people, and I was the best outside public relations guy. One of the reasons was we had these huge calendars with our name on it, and we gave them for them, the, the dealers, put right on their desk. And I made it the point to have index cards on everybody. I mean, we didn't have computers, not that I would know how to operate one, <laughs> but I knew everything about them, and they enjoyed my company as well as my join there. And I was very prosperous and stay there for quite a few years. Mm -hmm. uh, did you retire from there? No, I didn't retire from there. I got mixed up with uh, other things after that. You have to understand, you know, I work for Hill Holiday, an advertising firm. And Larry, did you ever use a GI Bill? For anything? No? No. Okay. No. I was so sufficient. Well, I, I, I'll tell you another thing, too, mm -hmm. but I'd probably be arrested. We, we had, it was, when I was working for AMCO, I had another business on the side. Mm -hmm. 
if you remember, we had an energy crisis. Gasoline mm -hmm. and everything was hard to find. So a friend of mine in the framing area was an engineer, and he came out with this idea of putting plastic stripes or strips. As you go into a liquor store, you go into a cooler, you separate the plastic, mm -hmm. you're keeping the cool, the cool, and the, in other words, it was a barrier. So the idea was we would have these barriers on the overhead doors of gas stations and garages during that time when energy was a problem. I, okay, yeah. See? Uh -huh. And the, the idea is they didn't want to spend money in gasoline and a lot of other things were at a premium. But these so-called barriers that we made, we put, made, got orders for them, put them up. We were working 24-7. They were so popular, so that meant that I was making above and beyond the call of my income. I mean, do you, do you think we could leave a few things? Oh, no, I'm already kidding. Mm -hmm. It's my life. This is my life. Right. So what's your life now, Larry? Well, my life for the last 20 some odd years, I've been, I worked for Ted Kennedy. Really? I worked for Ted Kennedy and uh, his people got me living out in Westwood. And of course, when I was working for Ted Kennedy, the manager, the campaign manager, was related to him. He was the one that was skiing backwards and got killed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, see, so he says to me, Larry, that's my first name. When we go back to headquarters, I don't want to, you know, do, you're doing any more of the Kennedy impressions. And I said, we will pay any price, bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend. <laughs> so I didn't do Kennedy anymore. Okay. But he got, me, he got me out to uh, Highland Glen. Mm -hmm. And it, I wasn't there three days before Helen recognized me. Helen that I'm with now. Right. After, so mm -hmm. She says to the other women, no casseroles for him, he's mine. <laughs> so Helen and I have been together all these years. It's God's way of punishing me. Oh. <laughs> I'm, already, I'm already kidding. <laughs> I'm already kidding. I hope okay. you, you know I'm already kidding. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Larry, how important was it for you to serve in the military? Very. Okay. Very. I felt that I owe the country. I think everybody should. And of course, my heart goes out to a lot of parents and people that lost their loved ones in the military. They made the, the sacrifice, the initial sacrifice. Yeah. Larry, did you um, join any veteran service organizations? I like used to belong, oh yeah, I belong to the, I belong to the, um, I, I still belong to the Dedham Legion mm -hmm. in Dedham and uh, I used to belong to the American Legion in, in uh, Newton mm -hmm. because they had the best times. And I hung out with a ga gang, a group. Uh, I was into waltzing. I've always been interested in, in dancing. And mm -hmm. In Denham we had Mosley's and when I got out of the service I had a foreign car. And, it's only, and it was a four cylinder and I could only depend on three. So I didn't go too far. And Mosley's was close by. That's the story. Mm -hmm. Interesting, isn't it? It is. Oh, yeah. I had no idea how interesting it was. Mm -hmm. Larry, let's, uh, let's get you back to uh, the island, the radar installation. Just Mishima. Wanna... Mishima. And I just wanted to... Reiterate. Bring... Oh, or rather, just kind of more, a little more details about the, uh, what the clothing you were wearing. We wore civilian clothes. Civilian clothes? Yeah. Clothing was not an option. Uh-huh. Okay. You could w walk around in shots and, and loafers, is, you know, the, lo right. the so-called loafers. Uh, there was no great demands uh, put on us. Uh, because of the isolated duty, uh, there was no uh, tough military, you know, 
it wasn't very strong. It was loose leaf. So as long as you kept that radar going. Exactly. You do your job, you do your job well, there's no problem. And is there anything else you'd like to uh, add before no, we wrap this up? I just want you to know that we had the best food that, that isolation could possibly. We had the waitresses, as I mentioned before, with mm -hmm. uniforms, and we had menus, three meals a day. So as far as our intake, our caloric intake, mm -hmm. we had no complaints. It was the very best that you could possibly ask for mm -hmm. under the conditions of isolation. Okay. And did, uh, do you ever have reunions with your radar mates? No, no, no? no not really, no. Mm -hmm. Because you have to understand, when we got out, there was the Vietnam thing, mm -hmm. and everybody went in their own direction. And as I said before, uh, I didn't have any intentions of rejoining the Air Force. Uh, as a matter of fact, at the end there, they wanted to send me to a place called Thule, Greenland. And I said, no, this is not the Air Force I joined. <laughs> I don't want to go. So then I... <laughs> I turned down the offer uh -huh. to reinvest, mm -hmm. to go to Thule, Greenland. Yeah, and if you're not familiar with Thule, Greenland, that's uh, a little cold. Oh, a little cold, gee. <laughs> <laughs> I think I fear cold more than I do anything else. Okay. Yeah. So, Larry, anything else? Well, I, all I can say is I enjoyed being part of the service. Uh, helping my, doing what I could for my country mm -hmm. and uh, getting great benefits from the veterans hospitals. Uh, had I had not been in the service, they, I wouldn't be talking to you now mm -hmm. because the veterans have been responsible for keeping me healthy and constant medication that I need. Mm -hmm. And I'm 80 some odd years old. Thank God. Okay. Well, Larry Mitchell, we thank you so much for coming and taking part in the Natick Veterans Oral History Project. Well, that was my pleasure. Okay.